Tonight I want to talk to you about the living word. The living word. And uh, I got this idea a couple of weeks ago when Cindy Warren sang her song on a Sunday night about the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And I thought, I'm not sure I have a sermon on that. And so I worked this up last week, and that's where the inspiration came from. If you have a worksheet there and want to fill in the blanks, number one, a surprise visitor. A surprise visitor. Number two, a confused mind. A confused mind. And number three, a burning heart. A burning heart. You know, Jesus had just been crucified and laid in a tomb. These two disciples had not witnessed any resurrection or sighting of Jesus. They decided to go home, and they were disappointed. They did not believe that Jesus was alive because they hadn't personally seen him. They had hoped that Jesus would redeem Israel and rule in Jerusalem. Many Christians get discouraged when God doesn't do what they want, want him to do. They had witnessed what Jesus could do, but they didn't understand that suffering was a part of God's plan. Let's look at this wonderful story of Jesus showing up and explaining truth to these two disciples. The living word, a surprise visitor. Luke 24, verse 13, And behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus. And you have to understand, you know, most of the traveling in those days, they walked everywhere they went, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And again, depending on how fast you walk, you know, it could take as little as a couple hours. But normally when you're walking or strolling and talking to someone, uh, it could even take longer than that. And they talked together of all the things which had happened. And of course, you know, the whole story, and, and you have to realize uh, this, this was the day uh, after this, this was after Jesus. I mean, he just rose. This was the Monday after Sunday. So everything was fresh in their mind. And all that went on, Jesus was the talk. Uh, his crucifixion brought literally thousands of people uh, to Jerusalem. And so, uh, you know, word had not really spread of Jesus' uh, resurrection yet. And it says, and they talked together all these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. And folks, every time Jesus shows up post-resurrection, he had a purpose and a reason for what he was doing. Whether it was with the disciples, uh, it didn't matter who, uh, who he was with. Uh, folks, Jesus at that time was uh, making himself known, letting everybody know, all right, that he, he is still the Messiah. Uh, he is alive, and he wasn't laying in the tomb, which the tomb was empty, but nobody stole his body either. And it says, verse 16, but their eyes were restrained uh, so that they did not know him. And again, folks, that's part of God's plan, and that was part of Jesus' plan. All right? They, God and Jesus, can do anything they wanted to do. And so uh, he was uh, letting them know that, that he was in control, and he did not want to, uh, them to know yet who he was. Verse 17, and he said to them, what kind of conversation uh, is this that you uh, have with one another as you walk and are sad? So the conversation starts, Jesus starts this conversation, and he's basically saying, you know, what are y'all talking about, and why are you sad? Verse 18, and then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered and said, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem, uh, and have you not known these things which has happened there these days? So the disciples were just shocked, uh, these two disciples, of the question uh, that this man asked. They didn't know who he was. They did not recognize him. Uh, and they, they just could not believe he was in the area of Jerusalem, and he did not know what was going on. And folks, 
You know, sometimes I, I, I think uh, God and Jesus has a sense of humor because, you know, when you think about Jesus, obviously because it happened to him, he knew what was going on, but he was making a point for these two disciples. Hold your finger there and go to Psalm 139 with me. Psalm 139. Psalm 139. Look at verse 1. O Lord, you have searched me, and you know me. Folks, Jesus knew everything about these two men. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. All right, it's not that he reads minds, okay? I, I mean, not like he's a fortune teller. Do not mistake that there. He just knows everything about you. And I, I think sometimes if we thought about that thought, you know, because there's times, I know if you're like me, every once in a while, random stuff just popped in my head. And what I have to do is I have to say, I reject this thought in the name of Jesus Christ. All right? Uh, it's, it's just random thinking sometimes. Things that you, and sometimes I even have dreams. I had one the other night of someone that I have not seen in 40 years. Had no idea what the trigger was uh, in all that. So I understand we can't control all of our thoughts, but we need to try our best to discipline our minds so that, uh, you know, 2 Corinthians says that every thought comes under the obedience of Christ. Verse 3, you comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. He knows everything about us. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. And you think your, your thinking starts in your head, but the truth is, Proverbs tells us, it starts in your heart. Okay, so he knows your heart. He knows your head. He knows where you're at. He knows what time it is. He knows, he knows everything about us. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, and I cannot attain it. So we know God is in control. Jesus knew everything about these two. And then it says, where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee? From your presence. Look at verse 8. If I ascend into heaven, you are there. And of course, we know that. We know that's where God is. That's the abode of God. That's where Jesus lives. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. Folks, he knows everything. He knows every thought. He knows everywhere we go. It doesn't matter if it's dark or light. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. So, you know, I love the assurance of this particular verse, verse 10. Folks, there is no place I can go. There is nothing that I can do. There is no harm that can come to me because I am protected. Now, again, I understand there's accidents. I understand, you know, people rob people and all that. But God is there with us. No matter what we are doing, no matter where we're at, no matter where we're going, God is with us. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as in the day, and the darkness and the light are both alike to you. What are they saying? When we're in the dark, we can't see. All right? God sees everything. It doesn't matter. What time? Doesn't matter. If it's dark, doesn't matter. If there's no moon up there, God sees everything about us. So we see Jesus was a stranger to these guys, but Jesus knew these two guys, knew where they were going, knew what they were thinking, knew the lesson that he was going to get over to them. So we see a surprise visitor. Verse 2, or Number two, a confused mind. And he said to them, what thing? Which, again, I think it's almost humorous that Jesus would say this because he knew everything. He knew the story that they were going to tell, but he wanted to hear it from then. 
He said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. And again, they describe Jesus, uh, you know, of Nazareth. But I think the next part was a prophet. And again, a prophet in those days were, were held in high esteem. But folks, Jesus was more than a prophet. He was the son of God. And, and a lot of times, even in the Old Testament, you know, you, you would, you know, look at miracles that Old, that Old Testament prophets would do. And there was a high esteem, there was high respect for a prophet. But folks, you and I know Jesus was much more than just a prophet. And, he, and it says, mighty indeed, they had probably witnessed some of the miracles, possibly the feeding of the 5,000, possibly, you know, uh, you know uh, other things of Jesus healing folks, and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and, and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Now, here you see the first point in what Jesus was trying to get across the point to them. The word hoping, okay? So what does that tell you? They did not believe that Jesus was alive, and they, they in their words, did not believe that, that he was the Messiah, that he was going. Because, folks, he is going to redeem Israel. He he is, and, and when we use the word redeem, he, he gave his life as a ransom for many. But we were hoping that it was he who would redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things had happened. So the third day had come, and, and you know, to their knowledge that Jesus had not been seen, Jesus was not alive, they did not have the proof uh, that they felt like they needed. And yes, certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. Okay, they told the story. But folks, if they did not have hope, then they did not believe what these women were saying. Okay, and it says, and when they did not find his body, they came saying that they had seen the visions of angel who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it uh, to be just as the woman had said. The, the tomb was open. You know, the, the wrappings were there. Jesus' body wasn't there, but they did not see then. See, but but him they did not see. So what are, what's the whole deal? What's what is he trying to get them to understand? Where's your faith? Okay, Jesus told the disciples. Jesus told crowds, listen, I'm going to die, and after three days, I'm going to rise. And how many times do you think in the gospel that Jesus told the 12 apostles that this was going to happen? Okay, and, and examples of, of faith and examples, you know, the one that we think of a lot of the time, was when they were out on a boat and, and they woke Jesus up and they just said, "Hey, are you you're just going to let us die? You know, you're going to let us, you know, shipwreck and die?" And what did he say to them? "Where's your faith?" And folks, if you if you look at that example and for Jesus to just stand up and say, "Peace be still," and the water smooths out, I mean, that ought to be plenty of proof, but, but you can see several instances where that happened, where something happened, and he just said, where is your faith? So these guys knew the story, you know, saw Jesus' miracles, but just they had hoped that this was true, but they were disappointed and felt like it was not true. Then it says in verse 25, then he said to them, oh, foolish ones, and slow to heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. So you think of this, and Jesus telling them, 
First, the, the word, oh, foolish one. He's just saying, you are being fooled, okay? Satan is messing with you guys, all right? And folks, I'm telling you, one of the things Satan loves to do, he likes to make right wrong and wrong right, okay? He, he fools us. He, he tells us things. Uh, even when he quoted scriptures in the Word of God, he misquoted scriptures, or he would leave words out. And he's just saying, listen, guys, you need to understand the scripture. You need to know. Oh, that's why. And, and I, really, I really believe this is what this whole thing is about. Jesus is the living word. And we have to read the word of God. We have to study the word of God. We need to memorize the word of God. We need to be able to go to scriptures. See, we're not always going to be talking to somebody and, and have our Bibles in hand and be able to flip through the pages and show them something. And again, I know none of us, can, none of us that I know can memorize the Bible. I'm amazed at people. I mean, I, I have seen proof of people that could quote not just a scripture, but much, much scripture. Okay? And so he was basically saying to them, you are listening to the wrong voice, okay? You, o foolish ones, and slow of heart to, be, uh, to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. And again, Jesus is speaking to our heart. Folks, I am telling you who we are in Christ. I mean, when, when, we, were, when we were young and we used the phrase and we talked to children, we'll say, you need to invite Jesus into your heart. And you know what I've heard some children say? They would just say, well, how's he going to get in there? He's too big. They're thinking literal, okay? And Jesus is just simply saying, you've got to believe. You've got to believe. You think about it, folks. Faith is everything to our, our, our system, everything to who we are and what we are about. Faith, it takes faith. I mean, you know, in the, in the New Testament, Hebrews 11, what is the whole chapter about? It's about faith. Okay? When you trust in Christ, you do it by faith. But these guys just didn't believe it. And here's the deal. Because they had not seen it. Okay? And folks, I'm telling you, Jesus' world, our spiritual world, is the unseen world. It's the thing that the world cannot figure out. I mean, people that don't know the Bible or have very little or no faith at all say comments like this, you know, how can you believe in a God that you've never seen? How can you believe in a Jesus that lived 2,000 years ago? How can you? And folks, the answer to that is faith. Because here's the deal. We use faith every day of our lives. Think about it. How many of you have ate out in the last two weeks. You've ate out somewhere in the last two weeks. Lots of us. Did you go to the kitchen to see how clean that kitchen was? Did, did you ask who cooked my food? Do you even know that that person had a food handler's uh, permit? Do you know what they put in there? Do you know that he might have been in a hurry and dropped some on the floor and thought, ooh, i got to get this and give them a full deal and just put it right back in your, in your pan. I know, I know, I'm not saying people do that. You are living by faith when you sit down in a restaurant and eat food that you don't know where they bought it, you don't know who cooked it, and you don't know whether it you know, was processed right or not. So we use faith all the time. But the faith we are talking about is faith in God. Faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? And, and again, you know, you can say oh, what you want. You can go back to the kitchen. You can do, I mean, even restaurants have bad days, okay? But I'm simply saying, when it comes to faith, and that's what Jesus was pointing out to these two men, oh, ye of little faith, is what he's really saying. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? 
And what were they focusing on? They were focusing on being disappointed. They were focusing on him. And, and I'm telling you, I think the disciples had the same problem when Jesus first came onto the scene. They thought he was going to be a king, but he was going to overthrow the Roman government and establish himself as king in Israel and rule that area. But folks, that's not. He didn't come. Same thing with Peter. I mean, what did Peter do in the garden? I mean, he took out his sword, and what was he going to he say? He said, we're going to whoop some folks tonight. All right? And what did Jesus say? Hey, Peter, put your sword away. That's not what we're about. Folks, I am telling you, faith is everything to your Christian walk. And we make statements. There are times that we make statements. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I wouldn't make that statement if I were you. Because what you were showing is, you were showing and you were saying, I don't have faith. Okay, so be careful. Be careful, especially in the hard time. And that's what he was saying. He, he was saying, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. Folks, it wasn't easy for Jesus to be on the cross. It wasn't easy to go through that trial in all of the cat of nine tail beating. But it was necessary. The suffering is necessary. All right? Because his blood spilled, paid for our sin. Then he said, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all scriptures, things concerning himself. He expounded scripture. Uh, basically what Jesus was doing was giving them a Sunday school lesson as they were walking along there. And I believe a text that he used, and again, this is just my personal opinion, Isaiah 53. Go with me to Isaiah 53. And who hath believed our report? Well, folks, there's a lot of folks that don't believe in Jesus. There's a lot of people that didn't believe, even in the Old Testament, he, what, there wasn't a coming Messiah. And who is... Who has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of the dry ground. He had no form of comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire them. What is all that describing? The outward characteristic of Jesus. Folks, you cannot judge a book by its cover. You cannot look at a person Look at a person say, just by looking at them, say whether they're saved or not. Okay? And, and again, I could go, we could, we could fork off there, but we won't. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as if it were our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our grief and carried our, our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. What is he talking about? He is talking about the suffering of Christ, the writer it. And Jesus was trying to tell these two guys his purpose for coming. It wasn't to overtake the Roman government. It was to die for our sin. And by his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He became sin for us, 2 Corinthians 5 says. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as sheep before the shears is silent. He opened not his mouth. Folks, I believe with all my heart, and I love the song, he could have called 10,000 angels. He could have come off that cross. He could have wiped out everyone in that courtroom if that's what he came to do, but he didn't come you know, to, for war, okay? He came to die for you and I. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? 
He was cut off from the land of the living, and for the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor there was any deceit in him. He was the only person that started in heaven and came to earth and went back to heaven. If you were in heaven and you had an assignment and, and, and you needed to go to earth, I'm telling you, the day in which we live now, I, I would have been, oh, I'm not sure y'all want to do that. Because Jesus knew he came to die. I mean, most of us, we, we spend most of our life trying not to die. Not that we shouldn't want to die, but I'm just telling you, Jesus knew when he left the abode of God that he was going to die. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed and he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteousness, servant shall justify many, for he bear their iniquity. Therefore I will divide for him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with transgression. He, was, he bore the sins of many, and he made intercession for the transgressors. Folks, he was giving them a lesson in who Jesus, the, the, the Messiah, that Savior was to come from the great prophet Isaiah. Isaiah was one of the most cherished prophets in the Old Testament. And he was sharing with them, I believe, who he was and what he was really about. Romans 10, 17. Look at Romans 10, 17, just one verse. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Well, folks, it takes faith to be saved. It takes faith for salvation to happen. It takes faith in believing that Jesus is the Son of God and hearing by the Word of God. What was he teaching them? They were confused over the story of Jesus. But he was teaching them through his own life, and through his own word. So we see a surprise visitor. We see a confused mind. And here it is, the, really the whole, the whole gist of what I'm trying to say tonight. A burning heart. A burning heart. Look back in Luke. Luke 24, verse 28. And they drew near the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone further, but they constrained him, saying, Abide with us. Which, again, indicated he might have wanted to go further, but I, I, I believe this was the divine appointment. I believe he was sent there just for these two disciples. For it is towards evening, and the day is far spent, and he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, he took the bread, he blessed, and he broke it, and he gave it to them. And again, I do not think these two were two of the apostles. I do not think he is talking about the Last Supper here. I think probably what one of the things, and again, it's just my opinion, that this could be exactly what happened on the day they saw the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. because. The apostles were around them, but the word of what happened had to spread. You cannot tell me 12 men and saw something like that happen didn't share that with people around them. Hey, it was five loaves and two fish, and it fed more than five. And when it says 5,000, folks, I believe it, they, they numbered the men in those days. So it could have been 15,000 real easily, all right? And when he did that, when he showed that, because you remember, if you'll read the, the deal, uh, you know, when he fed the 5,000, he blessed the food before he passed it out. So when he started blessing this meal, 
I believe the light went on in their head. All right? They realized and they finally was associating Jesus' miracles with what they saw with their own eyes. And he gave it to them. And then their eyes were open, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. I mean, he knew them, all right? It, the light came on, and then he vanished. And folks, we know, you know, in those 40 days that he was there, he, he came and gone. He walked through walls. He walked through doors, all right? He, he just, he came, you know, even to the apostles. You know, those, those apostles when they were in the upper room, and even Thomas said, you know, they were trying to say, Thomas, we've seen him, we've seen him, we've seen him. Oh, unless I, unless I see it, you know, them nail scarred hands, unless I see that, that, that spear in his side, I will not believe. And remember what he told Thomas? Blessed are those who have had, who have not seen yet believe. And it says in verse 32, and they said to one another, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened scriptures to us? Folks, the reason I entitled this the living word is because we're not going to talk with you. We're not going to walk down a road and talk with Jesus. This is a biblical story. But do you know what we can do? This is the living word. The Bible. Do you realize that you could spend time with Jesus every day of your life? And most of you probably do. But it's more than just reading. Okay, when you just read the Bible, you're not going to have burning in your heart. Okay, yes, you are obedient. Okay, and yes, you need to read. I do every once in a while. Now, I don't do it every year, but every once in a while I do. I read the whole Bible through. But here's my problem with that. And it's not a problem problem. It's just you have to read so much Scripture that we read fast and we don't comprehend what we're reading. And if, if, if you were, I honestly believe, if you could read four verses a night, and the biggest mistake we talk about the living Word is we don't take time. We don't slow down. We're reading the Bible to conquer and they said, when Jesus was walking, our hearts were burning. And it wasn't just because it was the presence of Jesus, but it was also the presence of Jesus. They were walking with the living word. And that's, what, that's the difference in reading to conquer something and reading to interpret something. Reading it a second time to understand it. Sometimes reading it a third time so that you can just let it think in to you, it, it, your heart, not just your mind, but your heart. So he opened the scriptures to us as he opened. So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them and gathered them together saying, the Lord is risen indeed and has appeared unto Simon. Soon as they got back, the disciples were making that statement. Now look what they said, and they, told, and they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. In John, the Bible tells us that Jesus is the bread of life. I don't know if you like bread or not, but bread is one of my weaknesses. All right? I'll tell you another weakness. Potatoes is <laughs> Weakness. They're not good for you. The physical part of that. But I'm just telling you, folks, we can be with the living word every day of our lives if we will take time in the word of God. And we study. And folks, I'll tell you the other reason you need to memorize scripture. Because when these random thoughts come into your head, you can say something out loud. And you can rebuke demons if, I mean, I, I don't see anything wrong with that if that's what you choose to do. But do you know what I do more times than anything? The thing that is tempting me, the scripture that I have in my head, I just start quoting scripture. Okay? 
Romans 6. There, there are so many. Uh, you know, there, there are so many. I don't even know where to start on Scripture quoting. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Okay? What shall I say then? Shall I continue to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How can I, who am dead to sin, live any longer therein? When you start quoting scriptures, I'm telling you, Satan does not like scripture. And when you put those, the, that living word in your mind and on your heart and you've memorized that, I am telling you, you will have victory over sin. And that's two things, folks. You've got to get in the Word, and you have to memorize the Word of God. Okay, the Word of God is it's that, that, that battle. It, it is the very thing. Saying these things, I'm telling you, protects you. And if we had time, we would go to the armor, uh, but we don't. Three scriptures, and we're done. Acts chapter 4. Go with me to Acts 4. Verse 13, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. These two guys, they were with the disciples. Do you not think they were fired up when they got back to Jerusalem? Do you not think that their face was just glowing? I mean, they said, we, no, they said, Peter's seen them. And, you know, I know what I'd do. I said, I, I know Peter probably seen him, but we saw him too. Why? He's the living word, folks. He walked beside us. He was teaching us scripture. And, folks, I am telling you, the key here is they realized that they had been with Jesus. The more of the word you get in yourself, you get in your soul, the more you will look like Jesus. The more you will act like Jesus. The more you will speak like Jesus. The more your thoughts will be like Jesus. And I'm telling you, you know, uh, I, I have asked many, many, many times, God, I need the mind of Christ. Oh, Mike's mind, it just, it drifts back. It thinks of things that I shouldn't even be thinking. God, I've prayed this many, many times. God, give me the mind of Jesus. Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Verse 105. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. What takes away the darkness, folks? Light. What is light? Man, Jesus is the light of the world. He is the light of the world. Then Hebrews 4, Hebrews 4, and I close with this. Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living. The living word, that's what our title is tonight. It's alive. I, I, I really don't understand somebody that would read the Bible and I have heard this statement not very often, but I've heard some people say the Bible is boring. And I'm, I mean, it just cuts my heart when I hear it. Usually it's either a young Christian and, and, or a youth. Okay, And I'm just telling you for me personally, I'm not picking on any, any of those because they haven't, they, they haven't matured in Christ yet. Okay, and, and I am telling you, one of the disciplines you need in your life I am telling you, is reading the Word of God, studying the Word of God, memorizing the Word of God, spending time with the living Word, which is Jesus. The Word of God is living. It's powerful. Man, it's powerful. The stories are powerful. You, you can have power. The Holy Spirit power. It's the Holy Spirit that illuminates Scripture. It's the Holy Spirit, uh, you know, that... That, and, and that's what I do. When I, when I prepare a sermon, and I have my sub-sermon, sub I normally have three points. But when I go to my secondary scripture, I literally, and here's what I do a lot of the times, I have a cross. Herschel Rye has given me four crosses. I have one in my bedroom. I have one beside my chair. 
I have one in my office, and I'm trying to think of where the other one at. Anyway, even in my office, it's sitting right on my desk. And when I go to a subtopic, topic, many times I'll pick up that cross, I'll hold it here, and I'll say, God, give me the verse to say. Give me the verse that we need. need. Why? Because you're hiding God's Word in your heart. It is powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and spirit. Oh, folks, the Word of God pierces our hearts at times. It pierces us. It convicts us. It sets us straight. It gets us back on the right path. We, there's, I mean, some people try to avoid that. And folks, you don't need to avoid conviction. You need to thank God for conviction. That means you are that you, you're sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Okay? And the joints in the marrow, it is a discerner of the thoughts and intent of the heart. Folks, I am telling you, he is the heart. These guys' hearts were burning. Why? Because they just spent two and three hours with Jesus. Wouldn't you love to have been there in the old days? Just walk into a place and there was Jesus with his disciples. Wouldn't you love to have went, you know, and just kind of snuck in the back and listened to Jesus teaching? While you can't do it with the disciples, you can do it every day of your life with the reading of God's holy word. Folks, I'm telling you, we have the living word. It is alive. It is yes. It is amen. It is real. It is everything to a growing Christian. I'm telling you, it has to be a part of your life if you are going to grow in the Lord. And I pray that we would never take for granted the Word of God and that we would hide the Word of God in our hearts, that we would memorize it in our head and that we would use it in battle against the evil one. Father, thank you for this day. and God, I thank you for the living Word. God, I thank you for Jesus Christ and just who he was and what he did. God, I pray that we would never take for granted the cross. He was a suffering servant. He was hung on a cross and died. But God, I thank you that he arose the third day just as your word says. And God, I thank you that he is alive. He is in heaven. He is with God. He's at the right hand of God. And Lord, we look forward to seeing him in person again. God, I know uh, the Spirit of Christ was uh, with us when we were saved. But God, we are going to see him coming in the clouds, riding a horse, and taking back his church him. God, I thank you that you can give us those burning heart moments. I thank you that we can read the Word of God, and there's times that even when I read it, Lord, there's just tears in my eyes because you are burning a thought or you are convicting me of certain sins or you're, you're just speaking to me through the Word. And God, I pray that we would have that personal time with you. God, I pray that we would uh, have that personal testimony ready. And God, I pray that we would share the gospel with others around us. God, we've got, you know, uh, the plan of salvation in our hearts and in our minds and in our Bible. And God, there are people that just need a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And God, I thank you that you have changed us. We are not the same since we have met the living word. So, God, I pray that you give us divine appointments. And, God, I pray that we would never doubt your word. Your word is true. It is yes. And, God, we love you, and we thank you for all you do and say. Thank you for this time of Bible study that we had. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.